Welcome to European Parliamentary Research Service podcast on why military mobility is necessary for Europe's defence. The new Commission wants to unite and strengthen Europe to better protect citizens against both internal and external threats. But this won't happen if we don't have the necessary infrastructure and procedures in place that ensure a rapid and joint European response in case of a crisis. Here the key phrase is military mobility. Want to know more? Stay with us. Baron Antoine Henri de Germany, one of Napoleon Bonaparte's most renowned generals, defined military logistics as the practical art of moving armies. The Roman Empire's expansion, conquest and defence also ultimately relied on military logistics. Applied to current times, this means that in the event of a crisis at any EU border, military personnel and equipment must be able to move rapidly across the territory. So defence needs and the development of transport infrastructure are as deeply intertwined today as they always were. Indeed, and in a political environment where, on the one hand, the EU wants to increase its role as a global player and take more responsibility for its own security, but on the other hand wants to ensure its resources are spent in the smartest way, military mobility has emerged as a key topic on the European and even transatlantic agenda. But can today's level of military mobility pass the test? Well, currently, training and the movement of military assets across the continent is severely hampered by regulatory, customs, administrative and infrastructure inconsistencies across the EU's territory, since each country usually applies different rules. And we need to bear in mind that since the 1990s, European infrastructure has been developed purely for civilian purposes. So you can build new roads, railways or bridges, but if they cannot withstand the weight of tanks and other military equipment, you have a serious problem. That's right, but efforts are being made to bring military aspects into the equation when developing the trans-European transport network. And there is also scope for the EU in further harmonising the administrative and procedural practices concerning the transport of military equipment across Europe, as well as simplifying customs rules. The EU and NATO are also working closely together to address these issues as it's in their mutual interest. At the strategic level, it can be argued that the 2016 EU Global Strategy marked a new milestone in the debate about the EU's role in the world and about the need to complete the common security and defence policy. Europeans want to take greater responsibility for their security and play a greater global role. So, from 2016, in the context of an increasingly unpredictable environment, member states took major steps to cooperate more on defence issues. Stay with us. One of these was the launch of the Permanent Structured Cooperation Mechanism, giving EU member states a platform to work closer together to deepen their defence cooperation. The end game is to build a common strategic culture among all member states. Another important step was the establishment of the European Defence Fund, aiming to coordinate and increase national investment in defence research and development to contribute to the EU's strategic autonomy. Yet another step was the creation of a coordinated annual review on defence. Military mobility fits very well across these initiatives, having seamless military mobility on European territory to facilitate training and ensure crisis preparedness, as well as to improve deployment in the context of its missions and operations abroad, is key for implementing all of these goals. And the way to get there is by leveraging existing EU policies in the civilian realm to create added value for the military. But this goal can only be achieved if the EU and its member states work in close collaboration, not only between themselves but also together with NATO. And as NATO itself lacks the necessary instruments to improve military mobility, its military instruments end where the EU's legal and financial ones begin. To this end, a structured dialogue on military mobility between the EU and NATO was launched and the two work closely together on a regular basis to share the necessary information for improving military mobility. So what are the next steps? Stay with us. Well, the truth is that progress in military mobility in the EU has been made, at least on the administrative side. But we'll need to wait till the European Commission presents its progress report by the end of next summer to know just how much still needs to be done. And while there's no deadline for military mobility, the general guideline is that by 2025, things should have been substantially improved. However, this does depend on the member states agreeing to dedicate funds for military mobility in their next seven-year budget, which is currently under negotiation. 
The 2025 deadline would be in line with the dream of former Commission President Juncker to have a fully-fledged defence union by then. And although no commitments were set in stone, the European Parliament has asked the Commission to lead the progressive framing of the European Defence Union numerous times. Without prejudging the outcome, it is becoming increasingly clear to all stakeholders involved that military mobility is an essential aspect of the EU's ambition to become a stronger global actor. You're listening to the European Parliamentary Research Service podcasts.